Australia was known to ancient seafarers as Big Java, the Great Southland, or the Aurea Chersonosis, the Dry Island of Gold. The Serena site bears a startling similarity to the ancient port of Tyre, even to the location of the docks and the freshwater springs. A typical Phoenician settlement of antiquity, an isthmus or an island adjacent to the mainland. Freshwater Point has two large reservoirs with here an ancient sluice race running onto the beach where they washed out the fines of the minerals. The ore bodies of the rich hydrothermal reefs left placer deposits and here adjacent an old gold deposit reef the bottom has been carefully swept clean. The gold ore was in veins of contact hydrothermal as part of a giant complex. Here we have a chunk of mercury ore, metacinnabar, from an adjacent vein out on the headland. The ore bodies were remarkably similar to those at ancient Zimbabwe, worked there the same way by fire and water and crowbars and today, eroded by the sea and polished by a millennia of time, here is proof of the great antiquity of this mining complex, where surface reefs were hacked out down into the headland. And this mercury vein is probably the world's richest and widest. Usually mercury or metacinnabar veins are only up to an inch wide. This gold in calcite vein shows polishing by the sea. Yet the waters here are quite placid the year round with only the occasional cyclone. This mercury vein has been excavated into the headland and a slag heap exists a kilometre away on a nearby beach. Huge basiliths and hydrothermal veins are the geology of the whole area. Here in the eroded docks and the smelting sites, we have both slag heaps and collapsed walls tumbled down by the cyclones, backed behind by a clay-lined reservoir. The rock from the walls was recently recycled by Aborigines into fish traps. North Harbour has collapsed and the pylons set in cement are eroded. The granite stones up to one tonne in weight are set in slag cement of copper, gold, mercury and wolfram from the adjacent mines. The pylons run in a pattern out to an adjacent road and a loading platform. The nearby beach has been denuded of its tumbled granite boulders for the construction of the same. Adjacent to freshwater spring are rich soils once cultivated and now have become a trap to four-wheel drive vehicles exploring this remote site. A road of quarry chips link the mining of a wolfram ore body adjacent to the slag heaps. This typical bell temple identifies the site as Phoenician. It has the usual womb shape and a table of unhewn stone for food and drink offerings. And it is sited exactly to the north of the stone Tophet or cemetery, exactly where it should be in comparison to other Phoenician colony sites elsewhere. Adjacent this is a boatyard of collapsed walls and a granite in cement launching ramp with its 15 degree slope and a hole at the top where once a windlass was situated. Adjacent fish traps, very old, are the largest in Australia. Stones now sunk deep in silt 
between five to ten acres in extent. Enough here in production to feed up to 1,000 men daily. The Tophet Cemetery has marked graves, hoary with lichen and age, built of quarried chips from a cobalt mine at Armstrong's Beach, some seven kilometres away. The marked graves have illegible script on the headstones. The east harbour of the isthmus at low tide shows a carefully engineered granite in slag cement construction of some 800 metres long. The slag here is iron furnace cement and the ore here came from Red Clay Island some 14 kilometres to the south. Ore chip fill has been scattered about by cyclones but the jetty itself is otherwise in excellent condition. Copper, mercury, dolomite, gold and wolfram were mined from the hydrothermal veins nearby to this site. The giant wall leads back to a freshwater reservoir with a sluice, adjacent rich soils and flattened sites overlooking the harbour. The reservoir itself is lined with clay from Armstrong's Beach and some of the andesite boulders set in the jetty cement weigh up to one tonne and came from adjacent beaches. Dolomite for the furnace bricks was mined on site near to the jetty in an adjacent reef. A more recent artefact is this cyclone flattened cast iron structure that's once supported a small water tower as a reservoir. And pieces of bronze plaque are scattered about nearby. No trace of this site exists in colonial records and coastal vessels were unaware of the site or the harbours and it remained an island until 1986 when the local council bridged it with a mole road. On the east face, up to 40 acres of ploughed soils, now overgrown, exist contemporary with the harbour and the reservoir. This granite stone shows horsa thimbleware and a piece of the recent iron rusts beside it from the latter day water tower. This huge jetty could even today host three vessels of 200 foot length, end to end, in its placid waters, sheltered from any wind. Today the Freshwater Point site slumbers after some three millennia, but this wall cement is as good and as hard as it was then. An adjacent knoll cleared of its rainforest has Stone Edge Gardens on its summit. To the south, Mount Funnel, named by Captain Cook, is a marine beacon of yet another enigma, a small mountain of concrete, beach pebbles in cement, a total conundrum to geologists and no freak of nature in itself. This piece of andesite granite also shows working by hand. Other pieces show working by drills and saws. An enormous amount of quarry fill links the harbour wall with the water reservoir and three large circular indentations may once have been derrick sites for loading. Here's another piece of granite showing horsa thimble wear. This refractory brick of dolomite and slag went out of, out of fashion in 200 BC. It is a half cubit brick from a blast furnace with its reinforcing rod hole and it's numbered in a script from antiquity and the script was put in by a stylus. 
This iron artifact came from underwater at the boat ramp site and is of cast iron encrusted with oysters. The same instrument is depicted in an ancient Nile River boatyard along with other boat building tools of the era in stone glyphs. Its particular use is unknown. <coughs> this iron artefact came from underwater at the boatyard and is of relatively recent origins, yet it predates Cook. It consists of blacksmithed iron and is a rudder pintle. Compared here is a modern rudder pintle off a 14-foot vessel for comparison. A second pintle turned up as well. These two pieces of sawn granite, probably done with a hand saw studded with diamonds in bronze, show working and drilling and may have been part of a Phoenician adicule shrine. sight shouts Phoenician. No other people in history smelled at ore on beaches or showed such incredible expertise in maritime engineering. This site is ancient and awaits the archaeologist today. In the previous video, we concentrated on the sites at Freshwater Point, central Queensland, with its harbour wall, boatyard ramp, cemetery, and mining operations. Since then, associated sites have been researched and the whole has expanded to reveal that an ancient Canaanite culture of miners were present here in the era around 950 BC. Nor is this area the beginning or the end of that particular history, but only part of it. Australia-wide and extending to Tasmania and as far as New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. The entire coast of Australia has ancient harbour walls, signs of occupation in antiquity, with correlated artefacts and other findings by current researchers out there on the Australian landscape. Petroglyphs in Egyptian, Hittite, Phoenician and Proto-Hebrew alphabets date the history of the findings and it is now obvious that the Canaanite sea traders of antiquity both explored and colonised Australia in the era between 2000 BC and 220 BC. They exploited the minerals and the exotics of the continent known as Ophir or Big Java. Old maps depict Australia as clearly as any other land with its rivers and in this case even an inland sea. While most Australians are taught that Australia was only recently colonised by the British as a penal colony, it is obvious that the Dutch owned and named Australia, including Tasmania, previous to this as New Holland and Van Diemen's Land. Historically, Australia was visited and colonised by other cultures millennia prior to that. The present academic hostility to research is motivated politically and sadly is orchestrated by a fear of land claims by people like Palestinians or Israelis who were here in antiquity and certainly colonised for some period. The overwhelming evidence now demands independent and unbiased research to find our real Australian history. 
The Serena sites are unique in that the sparse population to date has now not yet overbuilt or destroyed most of the sites. Yet even in the last 12 months some sites have been inundated by real estate development with an indifference shown by the academic world and the authorities. Serena sites are now being correlated with similar discoveries all over the world. And it is now obvious that Western history needs serious revision, especially in the Pacific regions. These plants found on various sites are not indigenous to Australian flora and were obviously imported to use as food and medicines. This plant, called the Phoenician potato, originates in Nigeria in Central Africa and turns up as a staple starch food all over the world in many ancient colonies. At Serena, it grows wild with a type of spinach on the now overgrown but once cultivated fields. Aerial photography of this coast adjacent to the mines shows the sites on the headlands clear of jungle with no regrowth factor. Similar photographs show harbours and walls clearly visible from the air, now collapsed, eroded by time and the sea, mere skeletons of the once ancient colonies. Serena was targeted for the extensive mineral reef and placer deposits, for its fossil hydrothermal reefs rich in varied minerals, and the adjacent slag heaps, the roads of quarried chips, the artefacts, and the existing altars today give us a glimpse of the era around 950 BC, when sea trading all over the globe reached its zenith under the Phoenician trading vessels and their expert navigators. This whole history was lost to us when the Romans wiped out the last of the sea kings at Carthage and along the Libyan coastline. Soon after, the old libraries with their maps were burnt and sea trading entered the Dark Ages until there was a resurgence around the 14th century AD by the descendants of the Phoenicians, the Spanish and the Portuguese. In the previous video we showed a coral encrusted artefact and tentatively identified it as an Egyptian boatyard tool. It came from underwater at the boatyard site, but on cleaning it turned out to be a priest's scepter with the head of the Canaanite god Bel, complete with his beard and Phrygian cap, the whole made of cast iron. This visage on the sceptre matches the stone head of Bell excavated on the Hawkesbury River in New South Wales and also is depicted on ancient statues and steels. The artefacts and the petroglyphs date these sites, the engineered harbours, the village tells, the clear evidence of complex mining operations, long before our own recent efforts in the last 200 years. They clearly show that the ancient sea traders not only explored the world, but in places colonised it. This video deals only with the mining sites at Serena Shire in central Queensland. We will not include here the huge body of evidence found all over Australia. Here at Serena, the evidence points to the enigmatic Solomon Hiram expeditions of the Old Testament, when fleets set out on three-year voyages and brought back to the Mediterranean exotics and minerals. A complex of ancient harbours exists here on the Queensland coast, with hundreds of slag heaps on beaches, adjacent minerals mined from the various reef ore bodies. Tells remain today of the tent sites built from quarried chip and rammed earth, 
and show clearly where the old mining camps once stood. Our own mining records of the last two centuries show no such activity here. And besides this, the whole here today is hoary with age and eroded by time. The fossilised slag heaps have still traces of the carbon and the coal used in the small brick blast furnaces. Invariably, there remain Thanksgiving orders of stone left behind at the mine sites. These altars are dedicated to Bell or to his consort Tanit, gods of the old Canaanite people, with an occasional altar to Jehovah accompanied by petroglyphs. The symbols here depicted are in the early scripts. We found a small stone libation bowl next to an altar and various petroglyphs speak of fleets of ships of mules brought on the ships and of the search for gold and copper. Shaft graves and other artefacts have come to light, while some sites have shown Aboriginal occupation overlying them. The dark people say that this activity was not of their doing, but of a different race. The ancient sea traders simply set up camps, exploited the local resources, and then moved on in the same manner as any modern gold rush. And yet in places it is now becoming obvious they settled in for the long term as the labour intensive walls and the engineering on a large scale clearly indicate. For the last 50 years in Australia, researchers have carried on the guerrilla warfare with universities and government administration trying to get their discoveries out there before the public. Academics who sympathise and step out of line are branded with the discredited label, which is the equivalent of heresy in any religious sectarianism. So what happens now? Any researcher without a PhD and no permit to excavate can well go to jail or be fined for removing an artefact or for excavating at a site. The administration at the moment is very wary of investigation on political grounds and the academics do not desire to rewrite their own textbooks. Yet this remains Australia's history, Australia's heritage, pertinent to both Aborigines and to present white colonists. No thinking Australian believes that such a huge landmass could have remained undiscovered or unexplored until the last two centuries of British history. Eventually, the Serena sites and the overwhelming evidence will force independent research. The empire of the ancient sea traders from the Mediterranean is now dust and very little remains of the seaport of Tyre, with the exception of these few pillars left behind by Alexander the Great's army. Nothing remains today of the huge trade empire of which Solomon dominated. However, in Australia, the mining camps, the harbours, the slag heaps, await the professional to give us a better view of an age where men explored in fleets of Lebanon cedar, when exotics from far lands flooded back to the potentates of the Mediterranean kingdoms. In Australia, this history remains intact, not yet overbuilt, and it is important that we explore and overcome the scepticism and the inertia of the historians to reveal this history before it joins the history of the Mediterranean in obscurity and the endless theories being born today of what once was contradicting the real history of Australia. <laughs>